Uh, Brian Sattel is uh, Senior Managing Director and Partner at Bonson Group, at the Bonson Group, in fact, joins us with his take on things. Brian, lovely to see you. Thank you very much for your time. Before we get to the Fantastic Four, the MAG-7, the rally in the techs, the growth stocks, I just want to get your sense in on what do you make of just the kind of interest we're seeing at the headline level with the indices, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ hitting record highs. Well, it's it's good to see, you know, I mean, we had uh, a, a pretty horrendous 2022 in the indices, a nice rebound in 23. And, and then to see that follow through into the new year, obviously, is a good thing. I just think that there's some selectivity that's needed at this point in markets, because a large part of it is being driven by, like you mentioned, just a couple of names. And so we're looking at other parts of the market to find that value. But. Isn't the Russell 2000 giving the market the breadth it needs? It's working on it. Um, I think there's more to go. I mean, at the end of the day, we've got a dollar right now that's trading at 17 percent above its historical average. And that is can be a headwind for some of those large multinationals, including some of the mag sevens that derive a lot of revenues overseas. The small cap or the Russell 2000 that you have mentioned, most of those revenues are domestic. And so it's a little insulated from things like uh, dollar strength. And there is some breath moving into the rest of the market, and we like to see that. And frankly, I don't, I don't think that is the ninth inning of that. I think it is, you know, maybe fourth or fifth. What would take us to the ninth inning, you think? Well, at this point, I think it's time. I think it's, it's you know, the gravitational pull out of some of those technology names that are trading at 40 times, 50 times earnings and finding its way into better valuations in the rest of the market. Um, I think that it's just more of a matter of time at this point as that as that plays out. And, and honestly, as, as long as the economy continues to do pretty good things, which it is, and it seems like with today's PCE numbers, inflation is moving towards the right path, then I think there's more room for it to run. So honestly, it's just a matter of time. Okay. In your notes, you've said that you would not own S&P 500 at this level. That's true. I mean, it, you know, if you think, you know, we're at about 5095 in the S&P, if you divide or if you consider about a 10 percent earnings growth for the year of 2024, which is about what we would estimate, it brings you to two hundred and forty three dollars a share, which is about 21 times earnings. And so I just, you know, historically, when you look at starting off anything above a 20 X on on a P.E. multiple forward returns for three, five, seven, 10 years are very muted. An average of 10 year returns starting at 20 X is something less than 4%. So I just don't think the odds are in your favor. And, you know, I'm fine to be wrong short term, but but long term, you're much better off looking for more of a bottom up uh, individual stock selection and, and managing actively versus passively. And you're saying that the MAG-7 have run ahead of themselves. Uh, they are, of course, 25% uh, of the index, 25, 30% of the index. And, and it's driving a lot of a lot of the multiple. And it, look, I would not bet against the Mag Seven. Okay, they're great businesses. They're the, some of the best businesses that, that you know ever existed, and, and so that's wonderful. It's just that at this point, um, with the rebound in twenty three and twenty four, if the paradigm is we're going back to a zero bound on interest rates, and so technology is the only place to be, I just don't subscribe to that, and I don't think that we are. I think rates will end up sticking around a little higher, maybe somewhere around inflation. And in that environment, I think it's more about earning an income stream from the equities that you own in dividends and having that income stream grow over time that it is basically betting on multiple expansion at this point. So we had Dan Niles in the previous hour from Satori Fund who was talking about the fantastic four that he likes, which is Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA, as well as Meta. I mean, I look at NVIDIA and I look at Meta, just their year-to-date performance. It seems like somewhat of a melt-up moment. Does that not worry you? Well, we don't own those names, so it doesn't worry me. But, you know, I, I think, again, they're great businesses. But that I happening think a lot in the market, that, Brian, that happening in the market, that kind of price action. Oh, in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I think some of those two names that you've mentioned, particularly NVIDIA, Microsoft, um, you know, it, there is an well. artificial intelligence. Yeah, and Meta as well. There's an AI component to that that is very euphoric at this point. And I, I, I do believe that it's transformative and that these things will deliver. But I don't mm -hmm. believe in the year 2024 that there's an, you know, an enormous amount of revenue that's actually going to flow through simply because of that. So some of those stocks, I think, have gotten caught up in some of that euphoria. Yes. And yes, it is concerning. 
It is indeed. Uh, you're also saying that this is a time to earn carry income and dividends. How would you play that story? Uh, I mean, largely speaking, in the past, it's been banks, it's been consumers, it's been energy that have delivered uh, on those themes. Yeah, and, and still this, you know, still the same. I mean, you know, the staples offer a good value at this point. A lot of cash flow, a lot of free cash flow being returned back to shareholders and dividends that rise every quarter. You get reasonable valuations. You get defensiveness. And then even in some of the technology names, it's not that I, I, I believe all of technology should be treated in one, one, one sentence. There, there's plenty uh, parts of it that are providing things like services and infrastructure for AI that I think um, add a lot of value. And so you get those types of names in the large cap tech space with dividends on top of that, that can be quite attractive, quite, quite attractive. Indeed. Uh, I want to talk about some of the names that you like. Uh, and from the consumer space, you like Clorox uh, as a defensive and great dividend grower. I do. I mean, Clorox is a three and a, three and a half percent yield, roughly. It is something that went through a, a, a pretty vicious cyber attack in September of last year. Last time I was on your show, um, I mentioned it as well, and it was coming off of that. The stock had sold off roughly 25%. Um, as they dealt with that, but management really came through and did a great job. And at this point, you've got recovery from then. The stock's up about 8% since I mentioned it last and about 8% year to date. And again, you're capturing that defensiveness. They've had same store organic sales up 20%, particularly in some of their health and wellness products. And so, look, it isn't the uh, um, uh, most exciting name, I guess, to mention sometimes. But at the end, when you've got valuations where we are, this is something we want to look at. Indeed. Uh, Brian, stay on with us. Uh, we'll discuss some, of, some more of your ideas when we come back on the other side of this break. Back with Brian Seitel, who is Senior Managing Director and Partner at the Bonson Group. Uh, Brian, uh, do you want to talk about IBM and Cisco? Because you were talking about how there needs to be some allocation to tech, but differently from, from where the market is focused right now. That's right. And, and IBM has been an early adopter into the space of artificial intelligence. And that's not necessarily the reason we own the stock. But it is something that is promising. And when you're starting off at a reasonable valuation, call it 15x, and you move to something into the 18s on, on a multiple basis, you're still quite literally half of what much of that market is, is trading at from a valuation standpoint. You get a nice 3.5% dividend yield with it. It's something that has been out of favor, but has a very much reoccurring business model and services and software that we like to see. And with their Watson X, and some of the AI partnerships that they've developed, there's real revenue coming through, call it 400 million at this point already, and more to come down the pike. And so we like IBM for all of those reasons. Uh, and Cisco as well. Similar story, you know, Cisco, you know, IBM is up 13% year to date, and so those things are coming to fruition. Cisco um, would be a little bit more contrarian. They've had a slowdown in some of their uh, telecom side of business and things, and we think that recovers. But, you know, their partnerships with NVIDIA, with, with Intel, with AMD, particularly uh, related to AI infrastructure, is something that's very attractive to us. And again, we're capturing something at a reasonable multiple with current cash flows, with a high level of free cash flow returned back to us in the form of dividends in the meantime. And I believe that for 2024, it's going to be a theme with potentially muted overall returns in the market. Uh, I do want to get your sense in, uh, uh, Brian, on, uh, the, on the macro data as well, the core PC number that came out, and internally among your peer group, how are people feeling about what this means for the rate environment going forward and what the Fed is thinking? Because we just got lines out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the Fed members, uh, John Williams, on Reuters, talking about how a rate hike is off the table, but they are, they're not in any hurry to cut rates as of now, though they are considering rate cuts. So it's, you know, read between the lines uh, and perhaps it all depends on interpretation. But, but how are you uh, and your peers feeling about the road ahead on rates? Well, you know, I mean, as far as inflation, you know, core uh, PCE came out at 0.4% for the month of January or at 2.8% year over year. Um, there's a component of that, which is shelter, that we believe will continue to trend lower, significantly so. And, I, and so we're, we're fairly confident inflation will get to go to, that, to the Fed's 2% target. If you look at interest rates, you know, I mean, the, the probability of a March rate cut on March 20th is essentially at zero. I think it's at 4% right now. 
A May cut is, is something very low, but then a June cut is about a 50-50. And if you look at the Fed dot plots and frankly where Fed futures in the bond market are priced in, you know that there's about 75 basis points of rate cuts baked in. And, and to us, that's perfectly fine. You know, we, we, we don't wanna see a zero bound on interest rates for the sake of having zero bound on interest rates. Having a positive real rate uh, is important, I think, for functionality in markets. And that's not necessarily something we're afraid of. Right. We also had Dan Niles, you know, analyzing uh, the resilience in the jobs market. I mean, when you look at the Jan number on jobs and you look at uh, the average earnings a year on year, the number of jobs available are outstripping the total workforce, which is out of work uh, or the unemployed uh, number of people. And so how do you kind of reconcile what's happening with that and how that would weigh on the Fed's position? The, the, the labor market is 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 tight. There, there's no question. You know, I, I I don't, you know, and we don't personally subscribe to there a need to be unemployment or a dramatic increase in unemployment for the Fed to necessarily lower interest rates. Um, it can happen that way, but I don't think it is necessary. And so when you look at today, initial jobless claims were at 213 versus 210 expected. Basically, the number we've been trending at, and and I believe that that's fairly healthy. We want people to be employed. You know, having a jolts number or job openings, which, by the way, have started to trend a little lower recently, mm-hmm. is something that is concerning. But at the end, we're trading, you know, this is a 3.7 percent unemployment rate in this economy. Earnings are growing and markets are fairly stable. And those things are not necessarily bad things. Those are good things. Those are that's a good environment to invest. That's a good environment to, uh, to invest. My only concern from a macro standpoint is that we have rates at 5.25, 5.5% at a time when the unemployment rate is still stubbornly at 3.7%. It's, 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 it's yeah, a big win for the government. I mean, the government would be like, look at the unemployment rate, but it's just uh, so different from past cycles. Well, the difference in the government is that as consumers, we've all termed out our debt. We have a refinanced mortgages over 30 years to 3%. And so we're a little less affected by, you know, interest rates rising maybe than, than years in the past. The government, on the other hand, has a whole lot of debt that's rolling over in the year of 24 and the year of 25. And there's a massive amount of treasury issuance. And so it's it's almost the opposite. We're, we're keeping rates high. And of course, those two things are tethered. Treasury and, and Fed are not the, they're two different institutions. But having interest rates stay high is not necessarily in the government's best interest. But at the end, it's necessary to try to bring that inflation back to 2%. And the good news is it, it will get there. It's just, again, a matter of time, I believe, before it does. All right. What's the big risk to the market right now, Brian? Well, generally speaking, I think there's risks to parts of the market, those overvalued parts that I've spoken about. And so if you're buying the index as a whole, I believe that you'll be disappointed. I'm not predicting some sort of a, a, a terrible market necessarily. There's too many good things that are going on in the economy and in the world, frankly. But that's not the point. You can own part of the market and do por- quite poorly. Those overvalued sectors I mentioned, trading at 40, 50, 60 times earnings. And then you can play in some of the more value-oriented, particularly in the dividend space, and capture really nice uh, cap, uh, cash flows that are growing and reasonable valuations. And so if you get overall indices that trade sideways for a year or two as, as multiples get kind of grown into, you can still make a, a, a great amount of money with some of these other names. And it was very indicative, by the way, in 2000. That's exactly what we saw. We had 15 years of indices trading sideways in a W pattern, and the dividend growth uh, sector did quite well, averaged around 8% uh, over the same time period. Brian, lovely chatting with you. Thank you very much for spending the time your Thursday night uh, to speak with us and give us your take on the markets. Appreciate your thoughts. Likewise, thank you.